Okay. And then I'm going to reshare my screen. All right. So let's get started. Um, I haven't forgotten anything else, have I? Bef We're good? Okay, just check. I'm like the, the literal absent-minded professor. Okay, uh, so what is the difference between div, div, hold on, come on. Uh, a section. an article and an aside. What are the differences, the technical differences between those different um, HTML, and that should be lowercase, these HTML elements. Can somebody tell me? I think like they're all containers, correct, mm -hmm. but, but I think, I mean, div doesn't really have any meaning. Mm -hmm. So where the, the rest of them would actually be a better choice yeah. <laughs> to use. Yeah. Uh, so we, it's kind of a trick question, as you probably guessed. There is no difference between any of these from a technical standpoint. Wherever you could see a div, you can use any of these. And there are probably more you can use. And that's fine. Uh, we, we are talking about how these are meant to be um, semantic. So what makes sense in our app at what point? Like, is this an article? Is this an aside? How do you choose? You get to come up with it on your own. So lucky you. Um, this is why we get paid a lot of money. So I wanted to uh, make sure that we're all aware that in HTML, there are semantic elements. Um, but we're not talking about HTML today. We're going to talk about here. Let me just, yeah, let me just delete that. We're going to talk about CSS. So CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. So what better way to show you how everything works than to create a CSS file? So let me do that. Uh, and we're just going to call it style.css. And here's a neat trick, uh, command and click and then create file there. It's a neat trick. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually run, I have an extension here called the live server, and I'm going to run the HTML file with live server. And the reason I'm doing that is when I run with live server, it's like I am running from an actual web server. You can look at a web page by just double clicking on it, just like any other document, and it'll open up in your web browser. But it's going to be slightly different than running on a web server. And since writing HTML documents, we're assuming you want to put them on a web server, it makes sense to do it in, in this way. Okay. So first thing I want to talk about is the box model. So, or before that even, we're going to talk about selectors. So if I wanted, or sorry, three times li, whoops. That did not happen the way I wanted, but that's okay. One and two. Okay, I'm gonna save this. 
You should see one and two, great. So in order to apply a style to an element, I need to select that element. And we can select them in actually a number of different ways. The first way is to just call the name of the element. So if I want to color uh, the div, or I want to add a style to a div, I could just come into my CSS file and say div. This will apply the same style to everything that is a div. So likely you're gonna have more than one div. And let me blow that up a bit, not that much. Okay, I'm gonna move that over because I'm not gonna have that many. All right, so uh, let's give it a background of, I don't know, I like aquamarine. I could spell. There we go. Okay. So this has now applied a style to everything that is on the page that is a div. Now there's only one div on the page, so let's change that slightly. Let's create another div. Okay, I'm gonna save that. Nothing appeared on the screen. Why did nothing appear on the screen? There's uh, no content for the div. That's right. If there is no content, the height of the div becomes zero. So we're going to need to do one of two things. We can either put some content in here And that's that's fine. Um, or we can apply. Uh, hmm, we can actually add a rule to our CSS. So let's do that. Let's give it our our um, divs. It's going to have a min height of I don't know, say one hundred and fifty. So both of these are now a minimum of 150 pixels. You also notice that the, uh, the spacing between the two has disappeared. Uh, I can actually come in here, remove this content, and it, the div still shows up. We've gone to the... Uh, Dev tools a few times in uh, in our classes, and I'm just going to dock this to the bottom for now. This is actually uh, one of the most useful things for you to do with the Dev tools is to look at a page, look at the styling on the page, and most importantly, how are these styles set up? Um, so again, this works the same in Chrome or, or Edge, depending on which browser you're using. So uh, it's gonna look slightly different, but at the end of the day, it'll do the same thing. What's the body? I didn't add a, well, the body's there in the HTML, but what is the body? It's on every page. <coughs> it's what the client sees. The body encompasses all of the content on the page. So yes, it is what the client sees. Um, there's something weird going on here. And I don't know if you've noticed, but there's actually a little bit of a space between the edge of my browser and this div. And the reason for that is default styles. You can change the style of anything to be whatever you want. However, HTML gives certain default values 
two different elements. So an H1, for instance, is going to appear and appear large. A P on the other hand, or paragraph, is going to appear small. And there's no reason that I couldn't make the small the the p tags text large and the eight headers text small. That's fine. That's up to me. And if we actually come and look at the text, let's uh, inspect this element, and we can see here. Yep, there are styles uh, layout. This, these are all fun, um, but it looks like there's, uh, there we go, box model properties. We'll talk about that in a second, but we can actually look at what styles are applied. So because no CSS properties are being shown, that means there are no styles being applied. Therefore, it's the default styles. So let's add, let's change this H1. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna say H1. And I'm going to say text size, text size, there we go, as, I don't know, uh, 5 p.m. So, six e.m. Oh, that's funny. It's appearing over there. All right. Why isn't that showing up? Hmm? Oh, sorry. It says uh, tab size. Yeah, it should be text oh, size. Right? Oh, you're right. It should say text size. No wonder. There we go. Uh, unknown property text size. Why? Oh, I see. I always get these confused. It's font size. There we go. And save, save that. And there. So I've now changed the size of the H1 to be bigger. OK. So applying styles like this, though, is a little bit difficult. You're gonna likely have a number of sections that are divs and maybe you don't wanna have them all have the same background. Maybe you wanna have some have one background and others have another background. And we can change this. We can actually apply what we call classes. So let me apply a class to this. And in quotes. Okay. So now I have two divs, one that is called first, one is called second. There are no rules associated with any of these. So I need to come into here and add. So when we're talking about classes in our CSS file, we start with a dot. We'll say dot first, and here we'll say background color of, I don't know, blanched almond. That looks like fun. <laughs> and the second, is going to have a background color of yellow. There we go. You may want to have several divs or several elements have the same styling, and you can easily do that by applying the same style two different divs. So let me add another okay. 
see that I've got another div here. So, sorry to interrupt. Did you just type the class to create the div there? Yes, that's a VS Code thing. So if you type dot something and hit tab, it'll create a div with a class name of whatever. If you want it to be another type of element, you would just do say p dot second or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of those things I forgot that other people don't know how to do. Okay. One thing you may have noticed about all of these divs that we've created are they take up the entire width of the screen. And that is because by default, all of these are block elements. They are, they are, they are square and they take up the width of 100% of their parent. And the parent for all of the divs so far is the body. And the body obviously has 100% of the width of the page. It doesn't have to be that way. We can change the box. So let me go here. Uh, let's go into first and we will go uh, width of 50%. You can use uh, percentages. You can use, uh, you can actually use centimeters or inches if you want to. Don't use feet or yards or meters. Um, or you could do percentages, uh, or you can use M or REM units. And actually, if you hover over it, I love VS Code for this because it tells you exactly what everything does. And an EM basically takes the standard size of a letter and multiplies it by whatever's on this side. So it multiplies the standard size of a letter by six. The standard size being one of those default styles that have been applied to. All right, so here we go. We've got now this div here. Let's have a look. And you can see the div now narrower than it was before. However, it's still kind of going to take up everything next to it because it is in a block. Uh, style. So what we can do is we can, um, what is it? Uh, no, it's display. Thank you. And what that does is it allows me to put new divs next to it. So let's do that. Let's put another div with a class of first next to this. Didn't quite work and I'll tell you why. It's because of this little gap here that's being taken up. And this is a default style. Now, luckily, because it's a style, we can change it. So let's go and change the default for all divs. And I'm going to say the, so that's called the margin. I'm gonna set it to a margin of zero. And what else is going on here? Oh, I know, I know. We'll just put it on everything. Luckily, we, can't, we have a universal selector and that is asterisk. And now these are being pulled straight in. Um, and now I've got the uh, this bar here that's taking up a little bit. I'm not going to move that um, if I take this all the way down. 
let's just change the width to something where we could see that they actually go side by side. So I'm going to say instead of 50%, I'm going to say uh, 45%. Now it's uh, now it's annoying me. What have I done here? The H1, oh, that's why. I put it in the wrong thing. That's that makes sense. There we go. And they're side by side with each other. They're a little offset, but that's just one of those things that you're uh, that's the life of a CSS developer. All right, so everything has a box around it. And you actually look here in layout, it tells you the size of the box. And it also has, it's surrounded by three different, three other areas. It's surrounded by the padding, the border, and the margin. So I've already spoken about the margin a little bit. The margin is the distance that it's going to push on its neighbors. So if I have a margin between two elements, the one element will push the other element away from it. So if I put in a, uh, let's say, margin top of, I don't know, 50px for pixels, by the way, a pixel isn't a real pixel because all every monitor now has like double and triple pixel uh, depth to it, but it, uh, we still call it pixels. And you see here now that I've given all of the divs a margin on the top of 50 pixels, it's pushed everything away. What's going to happen if I add a margin bottom? 50 pixels. Anybody want to guess what's going to happen? Is it going to overlap with the um, margin top of the, the thing under it? Yeah, absolutely. So you can see here, I've got this div. And if I inspect, Actually, show me. There we go. So we've here. There we go. So we could see, and actually, it shows you what the margin is with that light yellow. Unfortunately, I chose yellow for the background of my divs. Let's change that. Let's change that to uh, uh, early wood. I always like using different, uh, finding different colors. So you could see here that that div has a margin on the top and the bottom of 50 pixels. And the next div also has that margin. So even though they both have 50 pixels, it doesn't mean they're 100 pixels apart. It just means they're pushing against each other. In the middle here is padding. And for the longest time, I got mixed up with margin and padding I, it, for forever. I'm also bad with left and right. I know I'm 50 and it's left and right. But uh, what we, one way to remember is padding represents like the padding you put in a package. So if you want to, send a package, you, you put padding around it so nothing gets damaged in the mail or via FedEx or whatever. So let's see what happens if we put some padding into our div. Um. Oh, here, let me just put it on both. So what padding is doing is it's pushing on the outside of the box. So think of the content pushing out 
And this is, and so now that there is this padding, and again, if I go and inspect this element, you can see the purple area represents the padding. Okay. So that leaves the thing in the in between the two, and that's the border. The border is non-existent usually, but it represents the thickness of the box around it. So let me put in a border. And one px solid. Uh, that's a little too thin to see. Let's set it to 4px. There we go. So we've now got these green borders around. What do these borders do to the dimensions of the element though? That's, that's kind of interesting. Let's put an element inside another element and see what we can do. So I'm gonna go back to the index. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in another div inside this div, and I'm going to give it a class of child. Okay. Uh, nothing shown up. Why has nothing shown up? First of all, I have to look at the right thing. Actually, something did show up. So why did that show up? Why did this big green box show up in the middle of my div? Remember, I've set all divs to have a background color and a minimum height. So we're now also looking at overrides. And generally, the last rule that you apply that fits wins. So even though I have a background color for all divs of aquamarine, I have different colors for anything called the class of first and a class of second. Cool. I'm just going to, for the time being, comment that out. Not that. that. And now it's disappeared. It's disappeared because there's no content. There's no content, so it has no height. It also doesn't have any color. So let's do something. Let's, um, let's take second, and we're going to give it a width of, uh, let's call it uh, 80%. One thing to remember is that while we're very lenient with semicolons in JavaScript, we're extremely strict with semicolons in CSS. CSS will break if you don't put semicolons in. So let me put some content in this child element. And you can see the content is showing up here. You can also see that it is still got the same background. And that's because it's inheriting from the parent. So children, if you don't have a style associated with it, will inherit from the parent. So if the parent is has a background of blanched almond, then the child's going to have a background of blanched almond, unless you override that. So because we, we like trying stuff out, let's override it. And we'll just say background color of Let's find some uh, lavender. And there we go. So now I have inside this div, 
I have a another div that is interacting with the previous div. It, so this is the content of the first div. It's in a box. The box is being surrounded by the parent div and it's being and it's pushing out. So if we have this padding here and here and on the top and on the bottom as well. Or right, because of the margin. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that for a second. Okay. There. That's better. So the margin is now the single margin that was set, um, or sorry, the padding that was set up here in uh, in the second class. And this is why we could still see the parent. Um, let's mess around with the child. The child is within the parent, but what can we do to the child to kind of mess up the parent? Because that's what children love to do. All of you who are parents, you know that. So let's set a border of something ridiculous. 100 px solid and all right super so we're uh once again we're we're pushing out all right that's a, a little bit weird but it's cool um let me just find my note Okay, so we've got all of this. Let's get rid of this for, a, for the time being. Um, and rather than this, let's make another div. I'm gonna make a parent div. And I'm not gonna give it any styles. Let's save that. And let's now take this child div and put it inside a parent div. And uh, so I'm a little bit um, uh, of a stickler for making sure everything is properly indented. So I need to do, uh, do this obsessively. Luckily, Alt-Shift, oh, never mind. Uh, Alt-Shift-F normally fixes that. Uh, I'm not going to worry about that now. So that will indent this child element. Okay, let's save that. Nothing's changed up here. We expect that nothing to change because why should nothing change in our viewport? Because the parent div is just a wrapper, it's not doing anything. Okay, so let's have it do something. Let's give it its own border. All right, we'll give it a four. Uh, 4px followed. Can you tell I have no sense of color? So I've now got the parent. A parent does have its own um, size. Uh, let's give the child a width of 100%. Okay, so now it's going to be 100% the width of the parent element. That's 
a little bit weird and I like I missed a semicolon. That's why. Okay. All right. And let's do something with this. Uh, I'm gonna give this a its own padding of 50 pixels or 10 pixels, sorry. Hmm. That's looking weird and its own border of 3px solid Becca purple. All right, so you can see here that the child has burst out of its parent's grip. Again, all of you are parents and understand that. And that's because of the way width is calculated. The child has to be 100% of the width, but it's all the content. So not only is it this content here, or actually, let's go down here. Let's go down to this parent. So this parent is this size. The child within that parent is that size. And yes, it's the same width, but the padding and the border are also added on to it. And therefore it's bursting out of the bounds that we've given it from the parent. Luckily, there's a way, uh, a very easy way of getting around that. And that's with something called box sizing. And if I set it to border box, you can now see if you set the box sizing to border box, it says, aha, everything in that child must live within the parent. So it takes the padding and the border and subtracts it from the 100% width we gave it. I'm going kind of quickly because there's a lot of content to cover. Are there any questions of anything that I've covered so far? No? You got, you, see, I told you this was fun, by the way. I love it. Okay, I have to tell you the story of this weird color, Rebecca Purple. So one of the people who sit on the board of the, uh, the team that handles CSS, the responsibility of maintaining it, he had a daughter uh, named Rebecca and unfortunately she passed away and he caught, made a color in CSS, specifically in CSS in her memory. And this is why it's so, it's the saddest color in CSS, um, but I, I love telling that story. So we all remember Rebecca, isn't that great? Okay, so we've covered a bunch of things here. Let's color, let's co uh, since I'm speaking about it anyway, let's talk about colors. We can use several methods for adding our colors. We can here, let me, let me do, um, let me add a, a list or I have this list up here. Let's use that list, okay? So I'm going to come back to this list. I'm going to give each of these, uh, once again, I have to put quotes around it. Okay, so I'm giving these all class names. So let's do that. And just copy these two again. I 
I can I can count. And we'll do second, third, and fourth. Okay. So let's go and give all of these different names or different uh, coloring styles. So let's go here and say dot first item. So item. So as we've been doing, we you could just give the name of a color. And it used to be there were only 16 colors, but now if you search for web colors, and by the way, Canadians, I'm sorry, but you have to use US spelling for words in basically any of these languages just because Americans. We love you, Americans. And if you, this Wikipedia article is actually great because it gives you, these are the, the, the default colors and then here's everything else. And you can choose what you like from here. Um, normally, uh, they try to keep me as far away from choosing colors as possible. So uh, they uh, generally, I will wait for a designer to do the design for me and tell me what colors to use. And it's kind of interesting because all of these colors, you see that we have these different um, RGB values. So this is the red value, the gr uh, green value, and the blue value. So let's set something with that. I'm going to set the color of this one. Um, we're going to set the color of the first one to, uh, I've already shown you that. So let's use Let's use hex. So I'm going to choose uh, my favorite hex color, BA55A five, five, or no, BADDA55. Five, five. It's going to be six characters long. And what 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 did I do? Oh, they have to be strings. There we go. And not applying, why is it not applying? Just put in uh, X. There we go. So it says hex value and you have an extra D. B A D. Yes, thank you. There we go. B A D A five five. That's a really cool green. Normally, what have I done here? Hmm. <laughs> Quick to the internet, what have I done wrong? Is it supposed to be in quotes? Maybe not. B, there we go. Yeah, it's not in quotes. B A D A 5 5. VS Code's great because it tell, it shows you what color it is. There we go. It's the badass color. So, it's this green. Um, uh, so if any of you have ever heard of a game called Kerbal Space Program, this is the color of the Kerbals. Just bringing that up as a random factoid. So another thing we can use is Are the, the actual R, RBG values, 
RGB. R I always get those confused. So let's grab blue violets colors here. Or not those ones. These are the hex values. These are the RGB. So I can come into here and I could say color RGB. And oh, even tell, oh, I, I love this. Um, so I have to put commas between everything. There we go. And that sets number two. And let me just come back here. We're going to say RGB. So that is another way. You can use HSL uh, if you know what HSL means. A lot of people who work in print really like using HSL. Uh, I don't really understand HSL very much, so I always look it up. There we go. Oh, I hate going. Oh, see? Tells you tells you what you need to do for the HSL. So I'm going to grab that. Notice there's an A at the end, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So let's go back here. And we're going to come in here. And I'm just going to leave off the A at the end. Because that means I get to leave that off. And hue, saturation, and I can't remember the third one. Luminosity. Anyways, this is a way of coloring things uh, that print people love. So what was that A at the end? So it's kind of hard to, to show on something like this. So what I'm going to do is I, hmm, I'm gonna go to our fourth item. And I'm going to give it a color of black. Why, why would I do that? That is the default. And that is, also known as zero, zero, zero. Okay, obviously no changes. Uh, zero, 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 zero. So you can use three or six hex characters. Anybody know what I mean when I say hex? Hex is a way of counting to 15 using single digits. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F. Those are the, those are the numbers in base 16. So I've set this color to here. Um, this is equivalent to RBG. Okay, so still say is the same. If I add an A at the end, this gives me another channel. And this channel is an opacity channel. So this is going to make this a little bit see-through. And if I actually set it to 0 0.1, uh, color RBGA, no, it doesn't like it. What did I do? RBG, um. Just a typo. It's a uh, RGB. Yep, thank you. Dyslexia, it, it affects us all. 
There we go. So we've got our RBGA and hey, I can barely see that four. Let me change that to something where I can see it. The reason it's graying out is because it's opaque or it's sort of not opaque. It's the opaqueness has been turned down. You're actually going, um, designers love opacity. Um, so it's good to know how to use it. You can actually add opacity to anything by just adding an opacity property. Zero point three. And you can see my green is almost invisible. Let's turn it up a bit so we can see it. Again, they normally don't let me anywhere near color choice. But you know, this is CSS, so I get to play with whatever I want. Okay, and you can see that this is the same sort of thing. We're giving it more opacity, or sorry, more transparency. The opposite of opacity is transparency. But the name of the property is called opacity. As an aside, I recommend, and I've recommended it before, but for CSS, nothing is better than MDM. It tells you what all of these properties are and how to use them. There are literally thousands of properties. I'm not even joking here. We're, uh, let's go um, color, there we go. CSS, box model. So trust me, there, there are hundreds of these and you're never going to know them all. I don't know anywhere near them all. There we go, CSS reference. And selectors. But this is a great guide here. Here we go. These are all the selectors. As I said, hundreds. I don't know what most of these do, but you don't need most of them. Uh, uh, if you understand the box model and a few of the other things I'm going to uh, teach you, you'll be able to des design almost anything. And if you're having trouble, there's probably a rule in here that you can use that's going to help you out. People have done some crazy things with CSS. All right, how's that? I know I'm going very quickly. So if I'm going too fast for anybody, please stop me and ask me for clarification on anything. Uh, I think this is a great time for a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 10 after and stretch your legs, say hello to your family.
Hey, Robert. Um, hold on, hold on. Can't hear you. It's probably me. No. No, I just can't hear you. Darn technology. Oh, wait, yeah. That's because yeah. the mic was plugged in on the wrong computer. At, um, I, I've done that, so don't worry. Okay. Um, yeah, I was actually just saying at the start of that tech interview for like all those selectors, I said you'd probably have to be Rain Man to like memorize all that. And then she's just like, yeah, I have them basically all memorized off the top of my head. Um, I was like, okay. Not, not <laughs> all of them. Not all of them. Or like, uh, I guess she, I guess she must have meant like all the ones she uses. Yeah, I, I know, right. I, I know all the ones I've told you about so far, and a bunch of others that I'm going to tell you later. Um, and all the relevant ones, I guess. All the, all the, all the big ones, right? It's yeah. uh, all of, but yeah, yeah this no is way. kind of crazy. Um, actually, I know ornaments. Orphans. What does that do? Orphans. Orphans CSS property sets the minimum number of lines in a block container that must be shown at the bottom of a page, region, or column. Okay, that's weird. Why don't you just use padding bottom? Isn't this mostly like Flexbox anyways, unless you're yeah, use yeah. Flexbox. Um, that is, it, it, oh, I had to um, style before Flexbox was a thing. Uh, and yeah, it, was, it was rough, it was rough. But now that we have Flexbox, our lives have become so much easier. I've seen make, people make some like anima animations almost somehow without JavaScript. It's yep. like pure CSS. You can do it, you can do it. Yeah, some like incredibly detailed stuff. I've, I, yeah, I don't know. It seems like it'd take a while, but. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of fun, right? It's a puzzle. Yeah, but I mean, then, like some of them, some of them are like in almost like if it's like a painting, then like somebody makes like a CSS replica, you almost can't tell the difference. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let, ooh, challenges. Here we go. Animation with green sock. So give you challenges here. CodePen is a great site for looking up cool stuff. Uh, boat. So yeah, all of this oh. is regular CSS. Wow. Let's That's click on, point. let's click on boat. All right. All right, this boat doesn't do much, but It's fun to look at. Let's look at something else that's a little, oh, let's look at this. This is gonna be crazy. Yeah, it's all CSS and JavaScript. So a bunch of JavaScript here and not much CSS. All right, who, who else is cheating here? <laughs> nope, that's all JavaScript too. People keep cheating. Doesn't take a lot to actually do the stuff either. Yeah, it's kind of kind of crazy. Um, Especially if you use like the hover and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Oh you yeah. Have like a chain kind of effect. Um, there we go. This this is pretty famous. This is all CSS and HTML. Wow. Right. So here it's just a bunch of divs. There we go, 49 lines of div. Huh. And then they're giving each of the, uh, the elements its own color. So let's say we don't, let's make him badass. There we go, now he's badass Homer. 
cool. Looking a little sick there. Yeah, there, and I've seen crazy things that are, um, that you can do with CSS. It's, uh, it goes very deep and it's actually can be fun. It can be a lot of fun. Cool. So it's like uh, when you were in grade one and it was finger painting class. And, oh yeah, finger yeah. painting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like that for web developers. Some people hate styling, but it's part of the job. I mean, I did a decent amount of it like a year ago, maybe. It's just, there's just a lot of it. I guess it's not like it's rocket science or anything. Mm -hmm. You just need to know, yeah, a bunch of commands, so. Yep. What are the rules? How do I select things? What order do, do things uh, apply in? That's a good one. Hey, Todd. Hey, John, how's it going? Going all right. How about you? Pretty good. Good. Am I confusing you? No, no, it's been good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. It's so weird. I don't make this many typos when I'm actually coding. Yeah, I know it's it's a different story when people are watching. Like yeah. uh, I did my um, technical interview yesterday. And yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's just a different different setup. Yeah. How were technical interviews for people? I read I the tip. I read the tip. Them. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, you go ahead. Oh, I read the tip that was saying like, if you don't know something, don't like pretend to know it because they yep. know when you're making it up. So then Absolutely. I kind of, on the second question, I was just like, yeah, I can't do this off the top of my head. And then she just went like, okay, so you gave up on that really fast, even though it turns out you could, you knew like most of it. So <laughs> yeah, that was a bit, that was a bit uh, of a yikes. Yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of interviewing for uh, developers. So uh, yeah, I know what it's like. I've also interviewed quite a lot fairly recently too, I might add. Give another minute or so. There we go. People are showing up. Okay. Everybody refreshed? Ready for more CSS fun? Okay. Um, have you been, uh, before I go on, uh, you, the project this week I've been told is something called Tweeter, which I believe is some sort of Twitter clone. Um, I, it tells me to demo it, but I don't have a copy of it. So, um, I don't know what it looks like. Assume it looks like regular Twitter, but I'm sure you can handle all of that. So, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk to Chetna about, uh, why they're telling me to do things I don't know how to do or find assignments that I've not had time to look at. Okay, next subject, floats and positioning in general. So you may have noticed that everything that I've put in has been moved over to the left-hand side of the container that it's in. And that's good for many things, but not everything. Uh, matter of fact, centering is part of your life now. Being able to put something in the middle of a, a, a container is an important skill to have. Also, moving it to the right side of the container is, uh, is a good skill to have. So let me show you something. I'm going to here. Not that. There we go. Move that over. Okay. So I'm going to add, um, let's put an H2 and say floats. Okay. And what I'm going to 
do here is I'm going to make a paragraph of some lorem. Ipsum. I believe I've done this for it uh, once. And I'm going to do another paragraph here of some lorem. There we go. So two paragraphs of lorem ipsum. You can see it all showing up here. Now, that's, um, it doesn't look great, but I haven't styled any of it yet. So let's do, uh, I'm actually, I'm going to leave it as is for now. I'm also going to create an image, image tag. So IMG. So when you're doing an image, uh, it always asks you for two uh, properties, a source, which is where you're getting the image from, and an alt. Alts are very, very important when you're doing images because not everybody who is using the web can see. A lot of them are using screen readers, especially obviously the, the visually impaired. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I saw a talk by a completely blind web developer and they do their entire job by listening to web pages. They listen at, 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 a, at a ridiculously fast rate, like five times normal speed. You, I can't even understand how, what it's saying, but if you're, if you're a blind web developer, I guess you need to do it quickly. All right, so let's find an image on the internet that we like. Here, we'll use, um, of, uh, shark. there we go. So I like that image here. It's a stock photo, great. So we're just gonna copy the link and I'm gonna put that link right there in the source. I, that should work. Alt shark. Copy image link. There we go. I did it the wrong way. Oh, here. Ah. I stop photo.com. There we go. All right. So let's go back to our page. Do we see a shark? We see a shark. How amazing is that? And the shark is living between our two sets of text. Now, that's a very big picture of a shark and very small bits of text. So let me fix that up a bit. I'm going to target the image. And best practice is to generally use uh, classes for styling. So even though I could just uh, target an image, I'm going to add a class to this. So class equals shark. This image is, that's weird. Nope, that's not weird. This image is dedicated to Holly, by the way. There we go. All right, so let's go over here. We're going to go to shark and say dot shark. And because it's a class and I'm going to say height of, we're going to put it at, I don't know, 50 pixels. All right, a little bit larger than that, 150 pixels. Okay. So you can see here that the shark is between these two blocks of text. It's a block element. It's taking up the, or is it a block element? Now I'm confused. No, it's not. It's an inline block element. So a P is a block element. An image is an inline block element. But since there are no other inline block elements near it, it's going to be all by itself. But there's also this thing called float. And float's kind of fun. You can float something to the left, which is the default. 
so nothing's going to change. We can also def uh, float it to the right. Now notice that all the text that used to be under the shark has moved up. And what this actually does is it flows the text around the image. So if you need to have text that is around an image, you can use the float properties in order to do it. So once again, left. And right. And no float at all. Okay. Back in the day, we had to do all of our positioning using floats. And let me tell you, it sucked. Uh, luckily, a lot of web developers thought it sucked. And a few of them who are very, very bright came up with a couple of alternate ways to uh, position things. So I'm not going to go over floats and how to position things with floats because unless you want to flow text around something, stay away from floats. It's, it's just a bad idea. It's going to cause pain. So what we're going to do is we're gonna look at something called Flexbox or Flex. So let's make another H2. We're gonna call this Flex. And let's make, let's make a bunch of fun divs. Hold on, where is it? Where is it? Here we go. So I'm gonna create, um, Div or well, flex parent. Okay, and inside here we're going to create three um, other divs. And we're going to put in, these are called HTML entities. And they allow us to do things like put in images. So, and 91. Okay. And you can see there's a little hot dog, taco, and burrito. Uh, I'm gonna gr I'm gonna make that a little larger. So, let me add a class. As equals food. Okay, so let's come over here. Dot food. And we're going to give it a height of 100 pixels. A width. <laughs> oh, font size. That's what I'm looking at. Font size. That's said of uh, 4EM. Because these HTML entities are technically uh, characters. They're from uh, they're they're in the emoji suite, of which there are far too many to know them all. So we've got three pieces of food. Let's get them. Uh, Align so that they are side to side. Okay. Um, so they're all in the parent. So I can do uh, things, I can set them to inline block and, and such. So here, matter of fact, let me give them a width as well. Let's actually make that height of width. There we go. 
and we'll give it a height as well. Both a height and a width, just so that they take up room. And just so we can see them a little better, we give them all borders of, Two P X solid um, So oftentimes, by the way, when you are troubleshooting issues with your layout, um, one of the things I love to do is just throw in a red border around everything so I know where everything is sitting on my page. It's a really handy troubleshooting tool. Okay, so these are on top of each other, but I want them side to side. So I could, uh, again, put these as inline block and then have them next to each other. Let's do this. Let's uh, display inline block. So we go in, save. There we go. They're all side by side. But what if I want them in the middle of the the page? What if I want them to one end of the page? What if I want them spaced out? Luckily, there's a way I can do that. So I have this flex parent that they all live in. Okay, and I'm going to put a display of Flex. Okay. So it looks like nothing's happened. And it again, it looks like it, but not really. Um, we now have the, uh, the ability to manipulate things uh, fairly uh, or, or with a, a lot of um, ex certainty. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Confidence. My wife says confidence, so I'm going to go with that because she's always right. Okay. So when you set flex, a display of flex to something, all of its direct children will respond to rules uh, or, or it will, they will display in using the flex set of rules. So one of the things we can do is we can do align items, flex end. I'm going to save that. Okay, hold on, hold on. What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Oh, I'm going to remove the display inline block. There we go. Hey, there's they're still uh, next to each other, even though I got rid of the the, uh, the rule on them or the display on them. Um, uh, flex direction. Column. Now they're sitting on top of each other. Hey, and they're also moved all the way over to the right. And that's because of the flex end. Now they're all the way to the left again. You can actually, uh, there's also, this is, this is a fun one. Reverse or column reverse. I always get mixed up. And now the hot dog's on the bottom. So it's taken the items and changed the order that we see them in. This actually can be really useful if you need to deal with uh, alphabets that aren't left to right. So if you're dealing with say Arabic, which is a right to left uh, alphabet, then you can, using flex can really help you with your layouts. Also top to bottom is, you can set the uh, the flex direction to column. So it's a top to bottom like uh, a traditional Chinese. And this is this is actually great. So one of the things that I love to do, the 
default, by the way, is uh, flex direction is row. So I'm going to put that back into row. And what I am going to do is just do align items better justify content. Center. Oh my gosh, it's in the middle and I didn't have to do anything crazy. Um, there are a bunch of properties. Uh, I think it's space here. Flex. Um, I think it's flex flow. No, it's not flex flow. Wait, hold on. Quick to the internet. Um, so one of the great things uh, here, CSS tricks, uh, Flexbox. This is generally considered the best place to go to learn about Flexbox. So it gives you tons of examples. It shows you how everything is laid out. I'm gonna recommend that you come here and practice this stuff. There are a lot more things than I've shown you, but it's really, really handy. So uh, there we go. I could do justify content. Here, let's, let's do that. Justify content uh, space round. There we go. Space around. And now they're evenly spaced out. Uh, I could do space between. And now left, right, middle. This is so easy compared to how we had to do it back in the day. We had to put floats on things and clear floats and it was, ugh, it was horrible. So Flexbox really is a lifesaver. Uh, I cannot stress this enough. Justify, if know the justify content rules and you're gonna be ahead of the game. Okay, and it talks about aligning items. So you can align items to the top of the screen to the bottom. It can stretch items if it, if it doesn't have like a, a set width or height. And it's super handy. So I'll pop that in, the, in a list of notes that I will give after the class. But that is a really cool thing. Um, <laughs> what else do I want to show you? Uh, also, a lot of web developers, you may hear them cursing Internet Explorer. Jang, sorry, you have a question. Yeah, so I was just um, curious about uh, what's the basic difference between align items and justify content? Uh, um, do we need align items when we're doing, uh, because I think justify content is doing, uh, is placing so, items in the center and everything. So align items, space between means between the, the beginning and the end of the flex container in the direction that you're working in. So if you are in a row, then the justify is going to be in that direction. If So I have here three boxes and each of these boxes are in, this is in a row setup. If I change it to a column setup, the justify changes from left to right to top to bottom. So let me, let me show you. Um, Flex direction, here, remove that. So flex direction column. Now I still have the justify content space between, but now they're jammed together. Why are they all jammed together?
because the height of the parent. So the parent item is not flex. It's just a, a standard display. It's a standard block display. The align is the left to right bit of that. So if I get rid of this align items, you see everything moves to the left again. So justify is in the direction of the flex container and the align is the opposite direction. The perpendicular, yeah, perpendicular direction to the, does that help? Awesome, awesome. I'm gonna just undo all of that. Stop that block. Okay. And here it is base. Um let me let me show you something that would blow the mind of a web developer from 15 years ago. Uh, What's that? Okay, great. And I am just going to put an image of, oh, I'll get the image of the shark. There we go. All right, so we have our shark. Let me open up second. There we go. We've got our picture of the shark. I'm going to, uh, so this is just for a quick demo. Please don't use style tags in real code, but for, I'm just demoing. Do as I say, not as I do. So I'm gonna use a style tag. I'm going to call the body and I'm going to give it a display of flex. Okay, and we are going to do align items center and justify content center. And wait, 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 wait. Oh, right. And a height of 100 VH. It's right in the middle of the screen. It's right in the middle of the viewport. So it, no matter how I change the viewport, it's gonna stay in the center. Uh, a web developer of 15 years ago would have murdered in order to accomplish this as quickly as I just did. I think I did murder somebody. They were probably using Internet Explorer. So the uh, reason I rag on Internet Explorer is that Microsoft wasn't really great in following the, um, the rules of CSS and you always had to do something slightly different in order to do it for Internet Explorer. Luckily, Edge is as good as any of the other browsers. Not that I would use it because it's from Microsoft, but uh, they, it is an evergreen browser. It does follow the rules. You can actually come over to uh, Kangax CSS. And there we go. No, not Kangax. Here. Just Kangax. There we go. And this not only shows you the JavaScript things that are covered, there's also, I believe there's somewhere in here, 
Oh no, it's not can get, it's can I use. Is there a reason why Internet Explorer doesn't support anything? Like, is there a pro to that for some people? Okay, so back a long time ago in the mid to late 90s, um, open source was a very new thing. And Microsoft didn't like the whole idea of open source because why would people pay them a lot of money to use their products if they could use open source for free? So they spent a lot of time um, breaking things, breaking standards. Admittedly, I'm reading something into uh, Microsoft, but it seemed to, they would always break standards. They would try and set their own standards and become the default. In 1998, I wanna say, um, browser usage, 1998, here we go. So this is gonna be over time. Um, this is in 2021, but if we come back all the way here, where is it? Internet Explorer 2009 had 66%, 2004, 94% of all browsers on the internet were Internet Explorer. And at one point it was even higher than that, 95.4 in 2003. And I'm sure earlier than that, it was even crazier. And if you own 95% of a market, you kind of get to make your own rules. And that's what Microsoft tried to do in order to um, make sure that their platform dominated the web. They didn't, it didn't work out that way. Matter of fact, Microsoft is quite, uh, quite good to open source these days. Uh, they, uh, VS Code is a Microsoft product. I can't believe I use a Microsoft product every day and I like it. It's, uh, it, it kind of weirds me out. All right. Uh, can I use? is another great spot to go. So I'm just gonna click on uh, Flexbox here. So this tells you what versions of which browsers support whatever you're trying to do. So in this case, Flexbox. Red obviously means don't support it. Brown means we kind of support it, but not really. And green is full support. You, you're almost always gonna see red and brown over in the Internet Explorer column, even IE11, which was better than all the others. But uh, now IE has ridiculous, uh, there we go, global usage of IE11, 0.68%. Time for, time for a web developer party. That uh, it, it, we truly detested Internet Explorer back in the day. There are tons of browsers, like Baidu, Kaios, Samsung. All right, that's, that's a real browser I've seen before. Uh, even Opera Mobile supports it, crazy. All right. One of the things actually that I am, that may be concerning today is Chrome. Chrome is uh, taking up a large percentage of the global usage. So this here is 20%. Firefox is hovering around two or 3%. Uh, Safari, Safari, poor Safari, never does as well as they, as they would like. Um, there's nothing wrong with any of them. Um, Opera and Edge both use the same engine as Chrome. Firefox does not. Really, 
that's the only major uh, browser that doesn't use uh, the same engine for running the web browser. And when I say engine, I mean the much of the code behind the web browser itself. Okay. Cool. Uh, Flexbox, Flexbox, Flexbox. Selectors. We've been talking, I've spoken a bit about selectors. I'm going to talk a bit more. So, in general, you want to use classes for assigning uh, styles to things. You should avoid, when possible, uh, assigning them directly to an element because you never know when you might have to reuse that element somewhere else or another developer. Much of the development that you're going to be doing, at least in a professional manner, is going to be done with a team. Most likely, unless you go freelance and, uh, and do everything yourself, even then you're going to end up doing work on a team or inheriting a project that has already been created. So what you want to do is make things as easy as possible for the people that come after you. So try not to assign styles directly to elements themselves. So we can put all the elements here and assign uh, rules to them. If I want to have both H1s and H2s have the same styles, I can just put a comma between it. And now all of the H2s on my page, not that page, If I save it, there we go. They're all, they're now identically sized, right? So I made these H2s and now they're the same size as this H1. So commas, um, you can make, you can use a uh, child. So I've got this parent child thing going on here. If I do dot parent space, dot child. Now this is only going to affect any child divs or anything with a class of child that live under a parent. So if I make a div outside of this parent right here, here let's put a, a dot, dot child and And you can see that the styles that were assigned this child, which had the lavender background and the borders, isn't showing here. And that's because I've now changed the rules for child to mean, hey, you have to have an ancestor who's dot parent or who has a class of parent. All right, uh, what else do I want to show you? If you have an ID, what's the difference between an ID in HTML and a class in HTML? Does anybody know? ID is also, specific. Yeah, ID, should, you should only ever have one item with an ID on a particular page. This allows you to directly target one specific thing. You can assign a class or an ID to anything, just ID, sorry, ID equals header. And then I can come over here. If I want to assign, a style to this, I can just use the hash symbol and uh, flex header color uh, 
I'll love drab, sure, why not? And you can see I've targeted, I've tar I'm pointing at my screen and none of you can see me pointing, but trust me, I'm pointing at this one right here. So now I've targeted this by ID. In general, I would recommend against targeting things by ID, but this is a uh, this is one of those things where you're going to have different people give you different advice. So I like targeting things uh, with classes only. Other people enjoy or, or think that doing it with IDs is just fine. It's all opinion. All right. Okay, so styles. What happens if you have conflicting styles? That is an interesting thing. So in general, the last rule that is assigned to something overrides anything before it. So if I come over here, I've got this flex header rule, or better yet, I've got the, uh, the H2s are all the same size. Well, let's say I change the size. So I'm not gonna come up here and change it here. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna make a new rule. We'll say H2, and I'm going to have said, go, and it's gonna, I'm gonna set it to one EM. And everything goes back to 1 EM, even though I have two styles here. So the order in which you put the rules matters. So this, uh, and be careful, especially with large projects, it's going to be quite easy to forget that you've already put a rule on something and, and put a second rule on it. And then someone else might not understand why their element isn't doing what they expect it to do. Especially with uh, complicated uh, CSS frameworks. So the last one takes effect. However, Not always. And here, you may notice that I've given H2s a color of red. It has not overridden the second one, which I gave all of drab to. And this actually reflects back on something called a, uh, CSS specificity. I, it's a hard word to say. If you can say it 20 times quickly, you'll at least amuse people around you. And what I'm gonna do actually, is so I'm gonna show you this image. And this gives you the order in which specificity applies. So inline styles, which I haven't shown you, you should never use it, is a specificity of, call this a thousand. So if you do an inline style, and let me show you an inline style. Uh, you actually put inline styles here. So you will put um, background color. There we go. So that is an inline style. And even if I go and put a, uh, or flex parent, if I give a background over here, as a matter of fact, where's a flex parent? Here's a flex parent. And I'm gonna give it uh, red. It's not changing red. And that's because inline styles take priority. Okay, after that comes IDs. So IDs will override classes every time. Next comes classes. And then at the very bottom of the list is actual selecting things by their actual tag name. So H1 or div or whatever. 
John, how do you yeah. have your how do you have your browser um, updating or refreshing automatically? So I am using the um, and where is it? Live server extension. I do recommend that everybody use this if they're using VS Code because it will watch your, your files. And every time you save your files, it will reload your web browser for you. It also counts as a local web server. Again, make sure that you when you're styling things, you're styling things based on what you see in a web server and not if you double click the HTML. So if I come here, let's just reveal and finder. And here, so here uh, is my finder. And if I just double click on this, it's still showing the same page. However, notice the URL is a file URL. And this might cause you problems when you are styling things or in any circumstance. It's, you make sure when you run uh, HTML, you're running it in a web server. Live server extension is the easiest way to do that. Thank you. No worries. Thank you for the question. All right, so don't do that. Okay, anything else I wanna bring up? I brought up specificity. I can't even say it. Specificity. Um, I've lost all my windows. Here we go. I've got too many web browsers open. My kid always uh, teases me about that. All right, um, so I've spoken about specificity, I've spoken about that. MDN is your, uh, you're gonna be your savior. Always, if you don't know how to use something, MDN will tell you exactly what you need to do in order to use it. Uh, okay, uh, there's gonna be a breakout I've been told, or actually I'm reading right here. Uh, that covers specificity in more detail. One could say more specific detail. Oh, got a smile out of Allison. It was a bad joke, I know, I know. All right, and the final thing I wanna show you, and this is hilarious. Wait, sorry, is, when is that breakout? Um, I don't know. It just says breakout will be, Specificity oh. and detail covered in breakout. Because I could have sworn last week there they said there was going to be a breakout, and then I went to go like I went out, and then when I came back, like the message was gone or something. So I was like, all right, I'm, okay. either, I'm either getting dementia or. Well, you know, um, I've given you quite a bit of uh, information about specificity, so there, it's unlikely they're going to uh, cover more than that. Matter of fact, this is by the way. This is how working with CSS feels like sometimes. Damn it, move to the left. Yeah, it's so it's easy to get frustrated. May I recommend not throwing your laptop across the room? It is very expensive and you likely can't afford to buy a new one right away. So uh, you may feel like doing that. I know I felt like doing that. Matter of fact, I felt like doing that um, this morning. So uh, yeah. Um, so there's this cute specificity.com and it explains specificity using fish. It's, it's silly, but you're going to remember. Uh, so I, I spoke about, so I didn't speak about Bang Important. And you, as a matter of fact, let me just show you Bang Important. 
because you are probably going to end up using it at some point, even if you don't want to. So let's say, um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the font size of my H2s to a little larger so I can see them a little easier. So let's say I really wanted this one to be the same color as everything else, right? Now this one has a, uh, where did I, uh, it's the olive drab one, right? There we go, flex header is olive drab. And because I assigned it with an ID, it has a higher specificity than the color that I signed the rest of the H2s. So this has a, spe uh, a specificity of one. This one would have a specificity of 100. But what I can do is put bang important after, and it will just, no, it's like giving it a million. Yep. This, will, this rule will take effect no matter what, unless, of course, another developer comes over here and gives this one a bang important, in which case goes back to the original color. So try to avoid using the bang important. And when I say bang, I mean exclamation mark. Try and avoid using that if at all possible, because there's almost certainly going to be a way for you to do your, uh, your styling without having to use the bang important tag. And it's just going to cause more mess down the road. All right. Okay, I think I've covered everything that I'm supposed to, and I'm on time. I'm getting good with this being on time thing. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I will hold office hours again on Monday, and I will post this video likely on YouTube. Uh, and I will. I'll look at it first to make sure that uh, I don't see anybody's faces. And uh, yeah, that's it for today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I will see you Monday or Tuesday next week. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, John. John, you, you are welcome. Thanks for the shark. <laughs> for you, Holly, for you. Yay.